Well, hello, everybody. This is Ben Jennings. I'm here with Lewis McClendon, and we are into 1 Kings chapter 15, verses 9 through 22. This is lesson five in our um, study of First and Second Kings, and as we go through the Explore the Bible material. Lewis, how are you doing today? I'm doing really good. You were telling me before this that um, this particular lesson is about the um, about some important principles. There are four phases that basically we all go through in life, and uh, we're we're learning this from the life of Asa, who's the who is the main character other than God in yes. uh, in uh, First Corinthians chapter fifteen. So, give us a little background. What are we reading about? Okay, so we have Asa is the king now. We've had Saul and David and Solomon and Rehoboam and Abijah, and now we're going to have Asa. And the, the thing about Asa is that he goes through four phases in these verses that we're studying today that, like you said, all of us go through. And so to me, it's a good lesson because we can, we can get ready for a phase or we're in a phase. We can say, what do I need? What should I be doing with this? There is a challenge uh, that people make about the Bible that uh, oh it's this old dusty book that's not really relevant for today but we keep studying these things that happened a long time ago and they're so relevant Ab absolutely relevant i heard a pastor one time say if every christian would pick up their bible and blow the dust off it'd be the biggest dust storm in the united states <laughs> <laughs> that really is the that is the key i think for where we need to be so here's your objective statement kind of we've kind of already said it we can learn important principles by studying the four phases of Asa's life in this first phase is the phase of peace it's in first Corinthians 15 9 my voice isn't super great but I'll go ahead and read it <laughs> and in the 20th year of Jeroboam king of Israel reigned Asa over Judah and 41 years reigned he in Jerusalem and his mother's name was Maka the daughter of Abishalom and Asa did that which was right in the eyes of the Lord as did David his father so we're going to start off with a good king doing good things, which is unusual. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately. yeah. But uh, the good news is, is that he did right in the eyes of the Lord. And not only did he do that, but he encouraged Judah to seek the Lord as well. So he, he put some uh, commands in place. So it's not just him. He wanted the whole nation to get behind this, which is really, really great. That is a, that is a, a principle we can uh, see off, often played out in our own lives that usually when the leader's doing well, it tends to, the followers tend to yeah. mimic the leader, right? So yeah. that's what you have going on here. Right. And the good news is, and 2 Corinthians 4, 1, and then 14, 1 and 14, 7, is that it says he had quiet for 10 years on the one hand, but on the other hand, in verse 7 says, <clears throat> he recognized that he had rest on every side because he had sought the Lord. Yeah, and that, um, you see that, um, in verse 7 of Second Chronicles 14, while the land is yet before us because we have sought the Lord our God, he said, basically, let us build cities and walls and towers and gates while we have peace because we sought the Lord our God. We've sought him and have given us rest on every side. So they built and prospered. Man, that's the phase everybody wants to be in, right? Like Absolutely. Absolutely. So we see that. God prosperous. Yeah. Peace in our lives is a result of obedience. You know, obedience to the Lord brings peace. Now, no one can promise anybody a problem-free life, and we know there are, the Lord uses trials in our life to develop us and all those kind of stuff. So we're not saying that if you do everything right, that, that you're going to have rest on every side and nothing is going to happen. We're not saying that at all. But peace is a good benefit of, of being obedient to God because God does promise us peace. Yeah, and there's all kinds, and you put some in here. We won't take the time to read them on the video, but you put in here a lot of uh, verses, even from the New Testament, about about the peace that God gives to us. And uh, I love that Philippians passage where it says, "The peace of God will, will be with you." And then later on, it says, "The God of peace will be with you." Exactly. Uh, yeah. And I think another <laughs> way, another way to say it is that, like, if you're if you're being obedient, you don't always have peace. Or you shouldn't expect, you know, you shouldn't always expect peace. But if you're being disobedient, you shouldn't expect peace, <laughs> right? Exactly, yeah. yeah. And that's why I put John 14, 27 in there. It says, in the world, you will have tribulation. So it lets us know that we can have peace 
in a troubled world because right. we have the peace of God, the peace with God. And then I, I put in there Ephesians 2.14 that Jesus is our peace. So this, this peace can only be for his children. That's exactly right. And that leads us to phase two. So it's not always going to be roses. Sometimes we get into the next phase, which is trials. Yes. And so phase number two is trials. And that we'll see that in verses 9 through 12 of Second Chronicles 14. Here's what it says. And there came out against them Zerah the Ethiopian with a host of a thousand thousand and three hundred chariots and came unto Mereshah. Then Asa went out against him and they set the battle in array in the valley of Zephaniah and Mereshah. And Asa cried unto the Lord his God and said, Lord, it is nothing with thee to help, whether with many or with them that have no power. Help us, O Lord our God, for we rest in thee and in thy name. We go against this multitude, O Lord. Thou art our God. Let no man prevail against thee. So the Lord smote the Ethiopians before Asa and before Judah, and the Ethiopians fled. Wow. Yeah, Asa knows he's got a problem that he can't solve on his own. And he does the right thing and taking it right to God in prayer. What a great example for us. I mean, um, We've got we've got to be people of prayer, and so that yes. that's that's the right response to to trials, isn't it? Absolutely, and you know we're told in the New Testament the fiery trials are going to come, and so we we need to get to where we expect it. We're, we're, we're too many times we're shocked when trials come, rather than saying, "Hey, wait a minute, God promised there'd be trials." It's just that we need to know what to do. They're going to come. We need to know what to do. And Asa teaches us: take it to God in prayer. So I have a question, Lewis. The last couple of lessons have been what to learn on what to do from bad examples. Right. We're halfway through the points. I have not read the passage yet. Are, <laughs> are we dangerously are we dangerously close to learning from a good example? We've got two points. Well, we're going to get three out of four from a good example. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> Well, here's number three, Reformation versus, this is 1 Kings chapter 12, or for chapter 15, verses 12 through 15. And he took away the Sodomites out of the land and removed all the idols that his father had made. And also Maka, his mother, even he removed from being queen because she had made an idol in a grove. And Asa, wow, that's a, that's a bold move. And oh, yeah. Asa destroyed her idol and burned it by the book Kidron. But the high places were not removed. Nevertheless, Asa's heart was perfect with the Lord all his days. And he brought the things which he uh, brought the things which he had his father had dedicated, and the things which himself himself had dedicated into the house of the Lord, silver and gold and vessels. So he was on, he was making ref, reformations a great word. That's exactly what's going on. Yeah, and, and it doesn't matter who it was. I mean, whoever was not doing what was right and refused to repent, he just, he just really took care of it. You know, it says he removed the male prostitutes in the land. Of course, we know these are the male prostitutes that were coming in the shrines of the false gods. You know, right. and we do talk a little bit about that from Romans that we still have a problem with that today. If God's for something, Satan's against it. Right. But he took a strong stand and he removed the male prostitutes. And then he removed the idols of the previous kings. I mean, he really is cleaning house because if a king had set up an idol, I mean, the king would have had followers and they would be saying, we did this because the king said to do it. I mean, that was a, it's a, a small statement, but that was a big, bold move that he made. And then removing his probably grandmother from being queen uh, because she had an idol in a grove. And, and he did it. He did it publicly. He publicly cut down the idol, crushed it and burned it. So he wasn't doing this in a corner. He's letting everybody know. Hey, this this is this is real stuff here. We're, this is a real reformation. It's pretty common in the Old Testament to see idol pagan worship and sexual sin going together. Yes, there's a lot of what's that's a lot of what's going on here. Talking about the groves and the high places, right? Um, and so he's not just getting rid of the idolatry; it's all the sin that goes along with it, right? And he's doing that very publicly, right? And part of it was because he, the prophet Obed had stirred him up. When you read about it in Second Chronicles, Obed stirred him up for the Lord, and he he renewed and rebuilt the altar. You know, been been in use for a long time and probably needed repair, so he repaired it. But then 
he gathered all the people of Judah and, and, and some people from Benjamin that were there and some Jews from Ephraim, Manasseh, and Simeon to offer sacrifices and to enter a covenant. I, you know, when they entered a covenant, man, they wrote it down and they signed it. You know, we're, as a nation, this is who we are. So like we're saying, three out of four points, we're doing really well so far. Man, but I mean, you, you have my hopes up. Yeah. <laughs> you had my hopes up until I see this phase four and the words relapse. Right. And I'm going, oh, no. Okay, so verse 16, nobody's perfect. Here we go. And there was a war between Asa and Basha, king of Israel, all their days. And Basha, king of Israel, went up against Judah and built Ramah, that he might not suffer any to go out or come in to Asa, king of Judah. Should we keep going? I mean, that doesn't really tell me. He relapsed. What's going on there? Uh, yeah, okay. Um, he, he has a problem, Okay. So here we had, before we had a problem, and he took the problem to God. So in verses 16 and 17, he's stating that there's a problem. There's because a problem. Then, he, then you get to verse 18, and here's what happened, right? Yeah. Then Asa took all the silver and the gold that were left in the treasures of the house of the Lord and treasures of the king's house and delivered them into the hand of his servants. And King Asa sent them to Ben-Hadad, the son of Tiberon, the son of Herazon, king of Syria, that dwelt in Damascus, saying, There is a league between me and thee, and between my fathers and thy father. Behold, I have sent unto thee a present of silver and gold. Come and break thy league with Basha, king of Israel, that he may depart from me. Right. And what we just what, what we've just seen cumulatively, we have seen in so many people's lives. Okay. They get saved, they get into church, they're serving. And then after a while, they just start thinking, I don't need to do that anymore. Whether it be read my Bible, pray, go to church, witness, give, serve. It's it just something in us just says, been there, done that. And so he just seeks a political solution instead of going to God, you know. And we just see this played out so many times in people's lives. That this is a dangerous place to be when your first thought is not, I need to see God. Your first thought is something else. It's a really bad place to be. So he, and, and the correlate, what you're saying with Asa is he's done things with the Lord's guidance, the Lord's direction, the Lord's help. And then all of a sudden he's breaking his pattern. His pattern was to do it the right way. And now he's doing it the wrong way. Right. And so then we get to verse 20. So Ben-Hadad hearkened unto the king of Asa, unto king Asa, and sent the captains of the host, which he had against the cities of Israel, and smote Lion and Dan and now the key to the key to saying these things is to pretend like you know exactly how to exactly. Pronounce. I'm just glad you're reading the verses. <laughs> yeah, I'm giving. I, I'm just giving you teachers a tip. Just go with it, okay? And if it's wrong, <laughs> they don't know. Nobody knows how to say these. Okay, Abel Beth Macha and all Sidaroth with all the land of Naphtali, and it came to pass when Basha heard thereof that he left of uh, left off building of Rama and dwelt in Tirzah. The king Asa, then King Asa, made a proclamation throughout all Judah. None was exempted. And they took away the stones of Ramah and the timber thereof, wherewith Basha had built it. And King Asa built with them Geba of Benjamin and Mizpah. So it seems like it worked. And again, okay. that happens in people's lives. They skip a service. Nothing bad happens. They don't get struck by lightning. You know, they, they yeah. don't pray about this. They don't do these things. And it seems like everything is fine. And it took a prophet of God to come and say, everything is not fine. So that's when, so who was the prophet? Hanani. Hanani. And that's where you see 2 Chronicles 16, 7. At that time, Hanani, the seer, came to Asa, king of Judah, and said to him, because thou hast relied on the king of Syria and not relied on the Lord thy God, therefore is the host of the king of Syria escaped out of thine hand. Were not the Ethiopians and the Lubrams a huge host? with very many chariots and horsemen. Yet because I just rely on the Lord, he delivered them into thine hands. For the eyes of the Lord run to and throw throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in the behalf of them whose heart is perfect towards him. That's a great verse. Here oh, yeah. thou hast done foolishly. Therefore, from henceforth thou shalt have wars. And so we see the consequence of his actions. And the consequences are just absolutely huge. Um, if he had taken his problem, I mean, he, he handled his problem politically and his own eyes, and I'm sure the eyes of the people that were successful, they even got some spoils out of the thing. But 
uh, the prophet shows him that if he'd have done it God's way, he'd have had so much more. Because remember, you read in the verses that he took a lot of money and gave it to him, including temple money. Okay. Right. So his political solution was, I'm going to take the bounty God has given me, that God's prospered me with, but I'm going to pay somebody to go take care of something for me instead of coming to God. And so, so because of that, the, the prophet comes and says, okay, listen, here's what happened. You've lost a lot of money. <laughs> and this king has taken a lot of Dan and other towns and taken cities, storage cities out of Naphtali. And he's gained, and by doing that, he gained control over major trade routes of that area. So, I mean, this is a huge, huge deal. And so you've given the king of Syria money, you've given him land, you've given him control of the major trade routes. And God said, this would have all been yours. This would, I would have given you Syria. If you just said, okay, you got a problem. I want to take it to you, God. And God says, okay, here's, here's the answer. And my answer is going to give you, you're going to take control of Syria. You're going to have control of the trade routes. I mean, it. Judah lost a lot by not by not taking the problem to God. And and it seems interesting that Hannah uh, is it Hannah Hannah and I. He literally says, essentially, this is me putting words. Why are you so scared? The Ethiopians were oh yeah bad, and yeah. you relied on God and it worked out. Why why did you do this? You know right. you shouldn't have done that. And uh, but then we see what happens so often is shoot the messenger, right? Yeah, it gets worse. That's what, ha that's what happens <laughs> yes. in verse 10. Then Asa was wroth with the seer and put him in a prison house for he was in a rage with him because of this thing. And Asa oppressed some of the people at the same time. And behold, the acts of Asa first and last, they are written in the book of the Kings of Judah and Israel. And Asa in the 30 and ninth year of his reign was diseased in his feet until the disease was exceeding great. Yet as disease, he sought not the Lord, but to the physicians. It's the same thing. It's the same thing. Yeah. And Asa and, slept with his fathers and died in the 40th year of his reign. Yeah. I've always said this. I'm not, it's not biblical. It's just an observation. You know, if we make a decision based on logic, we defend it with logic. If we make a decision on emotions, we defend it with emotions, mm -hmm. you know, and here he is. I mean, his rebellious heart is, is revealed. He's so That's arrogant. Good. You're going to, you're going to question me. I'm the king. You know, so he's 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 defending some arrogance on his part, and there is no defense for arrogance. And so, what can he do? He can do something just dumb. Put him in prison. That makes no sense whatsoever. And it's so sad because he started out so good. Oh yeah, so well. And for me, in reading this, it just reminded me of Deuteronomy eight, where it says, "Where it says, listen, when I bless you, don't let that turn your heart from me." You know, and at first, maybe he didn't have all those blessings, you know, but now he has had peace on every side for a while. All these years, he's had all that peace. He's prospered. And that prosperity evidently just turned his heart, just like God warned what happened in Deuteronomy 8. There, there's a prosperity is a hard thing to deal with. Yes. And to be godly. I think I remember, is it in Moses that told them, you're going to get into the land and you're going to have cities you didn't build and crops you didn't grow and you're going to think and you're going to be tempted to say who is the lord right and that's what's going on here yeah i remember when i used to do marriage counseling and we'd go through the vows and sickness and health and poverty and riches you know and right. i'd always ask a couple what do you think will be more strain on your marriage poverty or riches and they'd always say poverty and i say nope it's riches really? you know because wow. usually when you don't have a lot of money you band together and say we can we can do something here but once you get something then you get okay this is what I think we should do with this. I want to spend this money on, on this, you know. So right. uh, riches can really have a negative impact on us. And I, I think that's part of what happened with Asa because he had the money, including the temple money, which is another whole subject. To, you know, so the money was there just to take care of the problem. No, that money doesn't solve problems. What's interesting to me, uh, Lewis, is that um, this is a story. There, there's so much personally that you could, you could uh, apply here. But this particular lesson is slated for July 3rd, which is, and in this story, you have a connection between the leadership of a nation yes. and, the, and what's going on with the nation. And you have a nation that because of godliness early on, yes, is prosperous and, and doing well, but later on allows for 
disobedience and and prosperity has led to and i don't that's kind of eerily similar to what we're dealing with in our nation there is absolutely is yep and so um and so the thing is i think we uh we as americans we can get really especially christians people who have biblical values we can start looking at our our nation and our leaders and we can be quick to, quick to criticize um you know and to and to di- even diagnose where we are as a nation but the truth of the matter is the nation is made up of a bunch of individuals right and, and we all contribute to that so i think mm-hmm. the first thing we ought to do as teachers teaching this lesson and as we um teach it to the people hey we got to make sure that we recognize this pattern and that we endure prosperity uh, as we have it uh, with, with godliness and That's right. faithfulness. So, Absolutely. Hey, great lesson. I appreciate it. Well, my ending statement on, on the conclusion is repent while you have time because Asa never did. And it's a good warning for us. And, and even like you say, for the United States, while we still have some time, let's repent repentance is is key god we love you so much we thank you for all the blessings that you've given to us and i pray that you'd help us not to take credit for the blessings help us not to make idols of the blessings god help us to um, be more in love with the giver than the gift and help us to live for you um, now and god if you do choose to to judge, help us to be faithful in that as well. We love you. We thank you for all you do in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, teachers, we're praying for you. Have a great week.